Henry Galley, what are you doing here? You just can't keep me out, Gus Zagarella. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Two Professional Writers, the show where Gus and I, a pair of people who write for money, react to interesting tips on writing and life. I take it you're here to, once again, show me some kind of writing tips that should maybe never be followed. Yes, so let's start with some news. Uh, those of you that are interested in kind of art and entertainment and follow such stories probably uh, were aware and were hopefully disappointed to learn that recently Jeff Bezos, one of the richest men in the world and uh, morally objectionable founder of Amazon, acquired MGM, the kind of iconic legacy filmmaking studio that, you know, owns the rights to, I guess, such incredible historic franchises as, you know, James Bond, Rocky, and recently they're the ones doing the uh, Hands May Tale TV show, and uh, they belong to Jeff now. Cool. The Handmaid's Tale belongs to Jeff. I wonder how long it takes until he markets the real thing. Yeah. <laughs> he, I mean, he thought, oh, fuck, this show, they, they have something going on here, and uh, I want to learn about it from the inside. <laughs> it's, it's the feel-good sitcom of the decade. I want to I wanna own the rights to this so I can like start sticking women in those sick uh, red gowns and white hats. Oh, man, how come no one's bought the theme park's rights to The Handmaid's Tale? <laughs> Wait, fucking wait. Anyway, so a lot of people have kind of been on two sides. Some people have said, uh, you know, corporate consolidation, generally bad for art, destroys creativity. You know, <laughs> Jeff Bezos, not a guy famous for treating his work as well either. Like, next we'll have writers shitting in bottles too. Mm. So people have been sort of wondering, what will this studio be like under Bezos? Because Amazon Studios, he's pretty hands-off for the most part, from what I know. But... He is particularly interested in gaining the IP from MGM. Really interestingly, on Twitter, going back to the roots for this channel, someone posted an excerpt from an old kind of biography of Jeff Bezos where he outlined his philosophy in a series of steps on what makes good storytelling. Yeah, you did hear that right, folks at home. This is a extremely rich man, one of the richest mans on Earth, who believes that the amount of money he owns and the amount of people he's screwed over getting to his position gives him automatic authority when it comes to writing and crafting stories. Unless I'm mistaken, I don't believe Jeff Bezos went to school for writing, I don't believe he has a degree in it, and I don't believe he's written any fiction or produced any movies. Yeah, like, I mean, obviously, there's some great shows that comes out of Amazon Studios. Obviously, if you're a fan of this channel, you know we're big fans of Invincible here. Great fucking show. Love Invincible. Yeah, if Jeff takes on a hands-on role... That's a little bit concerning. All right, so shall we get into it and begin to cringe? The rules, some of these are a little bit less specific, so I think it would just be fun to have the kind of freeform writing discussion, spread some uh, quote-unquote wisdom <laughs> for anyone who's been nice enough to turn up for the fourth video in this series. Exactly, and so uh, in, in a usual way this format goes, one of us, it's usually me, is uh, completely out of the loop in terms of what is about to be gone over. Uh, so I'll be experiencing it with fresh ears, fresh eyes, and fresh veins that will pop out of... Delivered fresh from the nearest Amazon Fulfillment Center. Uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, before we get in, for anyone who's curious, this is from the book Amazon Unbound by Brad Stone presumably available on Amazon, buy it anywhere else if you can. All right, you ready? Absolutely. Uh, Bezos me up. So we have this fascinating fellatio of an opening paragraph first. After more debate, Bezos boiled it down. Quote, Look, I know what it takes to make a great show. This should not be that hard. All of these iconic shows have basic things in common. Already we are off to a rough start. How are you feeling? I guess... In an idealistic sense, N nah, there's no way to put this idealistically. This is like, you know, typical. It's incredibly like, cynical, just make honestly. It a, yeah, just make it a product. Like, you know, just make it in common with everything else. Yeah, like, exactly. Like, be derivative. I mean, we've said in previous videos where we've shared our tips, there's obviously nothing wrong with, like, looking at other pieces of art for inspiration. In fact, I believe one of our tips was, like, it's crucial to learn what makes the greats great. But... I think, obviously, as you'll see, there's something a little bit more cynical about it from uh, Mr. Bezos. Anyway, it gets more unbearable. And off the top of his head, displaying his characteristic ability to shift disciplines multiple times a day, then reduce complex issues down to their most essential essence, he started to reel off the ingredients of epic storytelling. Christ, Brad, go easy. I'll have no cock left after this. <laughs> I, mean, I think that last part wasn't in the article. Yeah. <laughs> 
You know what I just heard there? I just heard Jeff Bezos is rich enough to spend all day browsing TV tropes and yeah. not have any <laughs> p- impact to his bottom line. Yeah, no, it's Jeff Bezos that made the Mein Kampf TV tropes page. That exists, by the way. There's also a Diary of Anne Frank one, so I think it balances out in some disgusting, like, <laughs> irreverent way. And Bezos was behind it all. The thing about this is that, like, the, the way that this narrator is describing shifting disciplines, it's like no when you're rich enough nobody gives a shit about your disciplines you just like have so many fucking hobbies and so much access to bullshit that you could just literally like pretend to be a different person every day and no one would care exactly he has so much money that no one is telling like no one around him is going how about you leave writing to the writers jeff because they'll get fired. It'll hire, hire someone else who's just a complete yes man. You know what the test of this is? Henry, can you describe for me Jeff Bezos' personality? Greedy, ruthless, ambitious. <laughs> no, 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 no. Those are just those are just the impact of his actions. I don't think beyond that it's easy to know because he doesn't really need one at his stage. Yeah, he's just a shell filled with money. He's a human piggy bank. <laughs> All right, so you ready for his first ingredient to epic storytelling? Epic storytelling, God. Number one, a heroic protagonist who experiences growth and change. We're off to a great start. Oh my God. W- does he just mean a protagonist? I mean, the thing is, Something that I think we've learned over the process of recording these videos is that, like, you can look at a rule like that and say, well, what's wrong with that? It can be good to have a heroic uh, protagonist who experiences growth and change. And yes, it can. The problem, like uh, Jeff is illustrating here, is when you say that that's the only way to do it. As we've had people point out in comment sections before, for example, you can have a character that has, like, a uh, flat character arc. They don't develop. But... More interesting to me is your protagonist does not have to be heroic. Yeah, but the other thing too is that, sure, there are stories where a heroic protagonist who grows and changes, like, it it works. It's really, like, it's a profitable model of storytelling and there's a lot of ways to do it. But this is like saying, like, well, in order to make soup, you need a bowl. (laughs) Like, you're kind of missing the point there, Jeff. There's so much in the bowl that is the important part of the soup. God, uh, it makes me think of something I really wanted to bring up in this video. Do you ever see these videos recommended to you, like, 10 things billionaires do every day with, like, a fucking picture of Jeff Bezos on it? (laughs) Number one, jack it furiously. (laughs) That's the thing. What pisses me off about these videos is, like... (laughs) Number two, Scrooge McDuck dive into money pool. (laughs) Number three, more profit. But yeah, what really fucking pisses me off about these is A, they're taking advantage of the desperate and naive, but B, it has what I call, like, the cargo cult mentality to success, where they copy these, like, superficial actions, but uh, ignore some of the obvious context as to why so many of these people came wealthy. Like, for example, like, is the, the early rising thing. Like, you can wake up at 3 a.m. every morning. I'm sorry, but it won't make you as, like, successful and rich and, like, ripped as The Rock, even though he does it too. It'll make you tired. Yeah. That's what it'll do. <laughs> it's, it's like, <laughs> 10 things billionaires do every day. Brush their teeth. Eat breakfast. Breathe. Yeah. I guess we could just call this, like, bowl philosophy. Yeah, bowl philosophy. But yeah, again, to go back to what we were saying about that first rule, like, your protagonist doesn't have to be heroic. They just have to be interesting. Interesting and motivated, I would say, are the only two things you need. And the thing is, like, we're big fans of character growth, but as many other people have pointed out in the comments of these very videos, uh, static characters can also be super, super interesting to other people, not us, but yeah. <laughs> they can be. So, like, you know, growth and change is not a necessity. And who are we to say that our way is the only way to do this? It's always Goku, isn't it? It's always, it's always Goku. Goku! <laughs> oh my god! Like, again, so then that we've, we've said privately before, we feel the need to say here, Dragon Ball is obviously an iconic, like, franchise of manga and anime, but, like, 
No one's favourite part of it is, like, oh, the real nuance to Goku's character, you know? Okay, so not only is Popeye the Sailor a deeper character than Goku, he could definitely beat him in a fight. Oh, 100%. He punched an alligator into, like, a full set of leather furniture one time. That dude is unstoppable. He broke the, like, animation <laughs> reel once. That's his own universe. It makes me think of, um, like, in power scaling, they're always like, oh, do they get prep time, though? They'd be like, oh, but does he have his spinach? Well, that that is the game changer, because, like, without his spinach, he can't, like, do everything. I mean, when he eats his spinach, he's strong to the finish. He's Popeye the Sailor Man. Next, we have a compelling antagonist. What are you... Sure, Jeff. That's the thing. Sure, it, it, I mean... It's more bowl philosophy. I don't disagree. The antagonist should be compelling. But there's, like... A difference, you know, between, like, Thanos and Gus Fring. <laughs> like... Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. Like, ultimately, like, these rules would really benefit from subheadings, you know? Yeah, like, what the f- <laughs> Okay, okay. And again, worth saying, like, I think a big part of this is I want to fight against, like, prescriptivism in storytelling. Because, as we said in the last one about the monomyth... It can help to use a formula to help get your bearings. You know, we've extolled the virtues of uh, how useful, like, Blake Snyder's stuff can be in, like, the Angel Dust video. But, um, ultimately, if ever you're getting to the point where you basically just see, like, storytelling and art as this kind of paint-by-numbers, very, like, you know, just, like, sticking, like, Lego bits together, just tropes and these vague ideas of, oh... Gotta have a compelling antagonist, whatever that means. You're fundamentally gonna tell stories that just feel kind of flat and uninspired. Yeah, compelling is the thing you use after you've created the antagonist to, like, you know, pitch it or, like, tell your friend about it. Or, like, you know, you've seen a show and you're like, wow, that was a compelling antagonist. People will listen to Jeff Bezos say something like this and they'll be like, oh, yeah, I recognize that that's a thing I like, but, like, yeah, that's <laughs> like saying... I like it when antagonists aren't written badly. Yeah, that's like, I like it when the movie is good, and the actors act, like, and the lines it are spoken well. It makes me think of this uh, line from Peep Show, where one character is commissioning another for a song, and he's like, I want something that when people hear it, they're like, yeah. And it's like, that's how I imagine Jeff Bezos directing the MGM people. <laughs> this is, uh, this is, like, so stupid and, like, like, head-naughty corporate already. Let's head, let's go to the next one. Oh, you're gonna love the next one. Wish fulfillment, then in parenthesis, e.g., the protagonist has hidden abilities such as superpowers or magic. Oh! Oh, no! <laughs> Fuck off, Jeff dude. Bezos' his horror anime. <laughs> Fuck off, man. Like... What wish does Jeff have left to fulfill? Fucking... He basically has real-world magic. Like, what the hell? <laughs> <laughs> like, okay. The thing, too, is, like, it's fine to have, like, you know, super-powered characters in your story. And, like, to describe that as wish fulfillment fundamentally misses the the point of why like the supernatural can be interesting people forget all the time that like in the original myths and legends a lot of which that were like oh these were all about people like coming up on their own and and like you know getting the boon and returning to the normal world it's like no people got out by the skin of their teeth fighting the unknown and sometimes magic is in there to give your protagonist an edge other times it's there to be an obstacle the existence of magic is not purely for wish fulfillment it is to create a universe like that uh elevates the 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 stakes of the personal through the use of obstacles that are just extraordinary i don't know henry back me up on this what do you what do you think yes. about this no i get what you mean like to run with your greek mythology analogy like what is achilles without the heel without like the downside the weakness to say something is wish fulfillment i feel like it implies there's this sense of like you almost get to like abdicate problems or responsibility like wish fulfillment is you're the powerful one and everyone else is like weaker because again like you said it's not really special to have like magical powers in a world where everyone does but 
a world where everyone has magical powers that's well written, is likely to be narratively interesting. Yeah, exactly. The thing is, too, is that this is more so a trope that works in the medium of video games, where the player character has much more agency over the world and, like, has all these abilities that they can unlock. That genuinely can make the player feel, like, really strong. But in terms of, like... Like, would you, would you look at any, like, show that's, like, a televised show and think, like, wow, they really did a good job making the one character feel really special as an audience insert, and that's improved the story, <laughs> like, dramatically? Usually, for me, it detracts from how much the other characters can contribute to the plot, how much they can do, and a story that is overly centralized on a single character is, for me, always a detriment, because... It, it, it just belies complete tunnel vision in regards to creative uh, uh, versatility. Yeah, and I think it's also, whenever people like Jeff talk about wish fulfillment, it's always burying the lead. It's people misidentifying what's actually good. Because think about all of the people who uh, love Breaking Bad because deep down they think Walt is aspirational. Oh my god, yeah. Like, they, they, would, they would misidentify wish fulfillment as being why Breaking Bad is good. I mean, he is basically a wizard. He's he's Walter the White, you know? He's a meth wizard. Yeah. It's, it's, it's that Chelsea Peretti joke where it's just like, all these guys think, oh, if I got cancer, I'd become like a meth kingpin. Nah, you'd probably just die of cancer. <laughs> yeah! Exactly. They're like, oh God. man, if I if I get cancer, I'll get five seasons of a TV show. Come on, bring on the cancer. I'll get to like terrify and abuse my family. <laughs> yeah, my beautiful caring wife who only wants me to live to raise our kid. <laughs> Hashtag free Skylar. Anyway, oh um are you ready for the next one? Yeah, please. Jeff returns with another banger with <laughs> moral choices. <laughs> oh yeah like, should i give my employees breaks or should i not should i bust the union or should i not Holy fuck. those kinds of moral choices eh jeff do we stop the people who are protesting the corporation or not <laughs> like yeah like what is a moral choice to fucking jeff bezos a man who like people have like died in his factories and, like, floor managers have just, like, thrown a tarp over them until the end of the day because they didn't want to have to shut down the factory. It's clear that how little he can elaborate on this one shows that, like, Jeff Bezos is not the guy to give any sort of, like, moral choice writing advice. Now, there should be ideology conflicts in your story, but, like, Jeff Bezos is the last person to talk about a set morality, and for me personally, I think a story's morality does not need to reflect my own, as long as there are multiple moralities, multiple ideological conflicts, and they are done so with, like, a sense of tact, and nobody is, like, straw man. Yeah, agreed. Like, no one wants to see, like, a pair of, like, lame cutouts of, like, two ideologies the author clearly doesn't agree with just kind of bash into each other for an hour and a half. Yeah, it's lame. The other thing, too, is that, like, again, I feel like Jeff Bezos might be, like, an epic gamer because this feels like he's played a lot of video games. Yeah, like all Mass of these Effect. are so video gamey. He played, like, The Last of Us or something. And it's like, guys, I've got it. I've seen The Matrix. You can do the, 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 the good guy thing, but then you can also do the bad guy thing, which is just the same thing as the good guy thing, but a little angrier, and maybe you, like, hit somebody. Yeah, he just played Fallout New Vegas and now thinks he's unlocked, like, the secret source to storytelling. I don't know why I get this impression, but, like, I imagine Jeff Bezos, like, plays Paragon... And then, like, in his real life, he'll just take all the renegade choices. Yeah, it's like, oh, you know, this feels like escapism for me. <laughs> I'm not doing, like, horrifically immoral things while <laughs> well, playing no, these video games. Well, no, that's the thing. The real world is his escapism because he escapes from his own morality. He's like, ah, it's not yeah. real. None of these people are real. They don't, they don't matter. They're just, you know, like, tools I use to get more money. Because Bezos loved the money. It's like the fact that Bin Laden, uh, like, they found Counter-Strike on his computer in his, like, compound. What a and I was nerd. trying to make the other day about, like, do you reckon he always played the terrorists? Or do you reckon he's like, nah, I'm a terrorist every day. I want to... It's like the Floros thing. Like, I don't want to be no terrorist. 
<laughs> I want some escapism. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> I won't give anything away about Flores' backstory, but like, maybe you're not wrong equating him to Bin Laden. <laughs> Jesus. All right, moving on. <laughs> this next one is another one that's just like, I think he might have just... <laughs> I legitimately think he either played a video game, or I think with all of these, he may have just watched, like, Avatar, or Avatar The Last Airbender. Oh no! I think Jeff Bezos got Avatar poison. Is that why all his hair, like, fell out? Is he gonna paint a blue arrow on his head? Like, yeah, is he Avatar poison? it's just him poisoned? and Marianne Williamson, the two most different people in the world, are just the biggest Avatar fans. Oh my god. Marianne Wilson, Wilson aka, like, Avatar Kiyoshi. Williamson. <laughs> Williamson, yeah. Gus is recovering from the shot, for the record. I just battled the, 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 the Rona, the tiny Ronas. <laughs> Give me a brick. So next we have diverse world building, but to tell you just how, like, no other word for it, ignorant Jeff Bezos is, next to diverse wor- world building in parenthesis is different geographic landscapes. <laughs> because, uh, as we all of know... Of course that's what he thinks world building is. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> it's because he sees the world in terms of, like, cubic feet of it that he owns. Holy shit. I'm just imagining Jeff Bezos being like, you know, I wasn't really keen on, like, Aladdin. It, it, it really, like... It's just all really, desert. like... Terrible. Yeah, it was all desert until that one scene where they went out into like the snowy mountains, and then I was like, "Yeah, this is pretty good. Multiple landscapes, you know." <laughs> this it, is really <laughs> not the not bump the movie up a whole point for me. Jeff Bezos looks at that and thinks, "Diverse world building. This is fucking. Like, this is fucking like Doctor Steve Brule's writing advice. This is like yeah. you, can't, you can't just have the forest all the time. You can't have a story that's all forest. You gotta throw a desert in there. Fucking with some water. You gotta put no a, idea, like, Je- You gotta put a fjord or a butt in there. Jeff Bezos walks in and it's like, guys, look, I, I'm liking the movie, but it's lacking something. It needs to be more diverse in terms of topography. Stick some hills. Maybe a valley. We'll put a river through there. Let's let's go spicy. <laughs> like just who who looks at, at Earth on this way? So this is either Avatar: The Last Airbender or James Cameron's Avatar because it was just like yeah, oh, yeah, it's one of the avatars. You got mountains on the ground. You got mountains in the sky. You got trees all over the fucking place. This is awesome. <laughs> This is the best thing I've ever seen. <laughs> These trees grow other trees, and everything's glowing. <laughs> God, uh, for context, I feel like we should specify just for like the kind of entry level people watching this. World building just refers to every single kind of like wider detail of your fictional world, from the topography to the sociology, how the cultures work, if there's like rules to it. Just it's it's essentially everything that isn't character plot tone and atmosphere is world building it's not whether there's fucking hills you could have a story that takes place entirely in like wintry tundra but you can also have like plenty of cultures that live there because that's the case in real life yeah i mean you know sure if you want to do the whole globe trotting adventure thing it's cool to have multiple landscapes but also this is like fucking you know, in any live action series, this is like, great, Jeff. Yeah, let's spend more money on a second shooting location. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. Real, doing us a solid here. I mean, as if Jeff Bezos ever thinks in terms of, is that too much money when it comes to anything but, like, paying his workers or investing in, like, safety and comfort for them. This dude's so rich, he, like, doesn't even know that money is an item anymore. Like, he is just, <laughs> he's just looking at this, it's like, oh, we're just trying to maximize how epic it would be. Yeah, we're just trying to add epic to this fucking fucking 2012 ass Jeff it, it is fucking rich people the reason they're like fucking immortal is because they never left 2012 yeah Jeff Bezos is an epic bacon narwhal of Chuck Wendig proportions yeah we should cover his writing advice on here sometime <laughs> big Chuck Wendig so uh yeah that was Jeff's take on why it's really important to have hills and valleys if you want an epic story yeah. ready for the next one yeah hit me up urgency to watch next episode then in parenthesis cliffhangers (laughs) he's like the anti-lily orchard but he's shit too 
I was about to say, like, this is one that Lily would be like, wait a minute, this is addiction-based storytelling? To a certain extent, she's right about that, because this is the most, like... I mean, Jeff is basically framing it. Like, urgency to watch next episode. That's, that's pretty unambiguous in its language there. This is a personal anecdote, but, like... I remember having, like, VHS copies of uh, the old black and white Lost in Space show when I was, like, a kid. I would, like, watch some of these, and, like, when I would get to the end of a VHS, because, you know, I only had, like, a few, so I got to the end of one, and, like, what happened was, like, some bomb went off, and Agent Smith was, like, lunging to get out of the way, and Will was, like, Will uh, was caught, like, right in the center of it, like, with the robot, and it's like, oh, what happens next? And I didn't have, like, the next VHS, so I'm like... Whoa. You fucking died. Yeah, yeah. I was like, I was like, ah, well, that's annoying. He didn't get out of the cock a duty car. But here's the thing. I was a tenacious kid. I did eventually track down the next episode. And it was like some bullshit. Like, oh, turns out they weren't exactly as close to the explosive as they were in the previous shot. How about that? And then the rest of the episode's completely unrelated to the explosion. And it's just like, it's just like... That is so scummy. That is such like a it's cheap such soap move. opera storytelling. Yeah, like it is a substitute for tension. And and I think, and this is gonna make me sound like Lily Orchard, but like whatever. I think this is one of her like good points. There are shows out there that will be like in the name of like supposedly slow burn pacing that will just be the most tensionless, boring, droning, all foreshadowing all exposition like ventures and then the last like five minutes of an episode will be like oh shit something's about to happen that's what gets you invested in the next episode which will be the same thing it will do the same like fucking droning boring nonsense and it'll just every single time it'll try to get you with that little bit of action yeah this is even more pronounced in like anime (laughs) because because yeah because of budget because of because of budget that's a money prop the most interesting things in this show happen in your head between episodes <laughs> <laughs> Rooster Teeth Ruby, because that, that costs you? us no money <laughs> oh god, god damn it but yeah i think we're both agreed on the fact that like cliffhangers can work but most of the time they're pretty fucking cheap to be honest with you i mean what is it are there like jokes about shows like the walking dead just constant cliffhangers yeah, just, like, don't do it all the time. The occasional ones are good. Uh, like, personally, I think cliffhangers work, work best if it's, like, a two-part event. Like... Yeah. If it's if it's every single time, then, like, the... it's it's It'll be a show made for binging and nothing else. Because, like, no longer will the episodes on their own be interesting. Yeah, it's true. Like, I feel like... This is a sweeping generalization because a lot of shows still do this, but like it, it's it's not the conventional wisdom anymore. But like if it's like gone are the days when people try to just have really phenomenal like standalone episodes, I think that's something we're very much trying with like Lesses Morgan and stuff like that. That we want each episode to like shine and be able to be good in its own right. But like it feels like it's less rewarded these days than having just an addictive bingeable show that you can knock out in a weekend and then forget about. I can tell you one thing, Castlevania has some of, like, my favorite standalone episodes in uh, recent animation history. Uh, I think also um, Invincible did a pretty good job with self-contained adventures. Like, it obviously had an overarching story. Because they had a great villain of the week system. Yeah, yeah, like, I think they did a good job with that. Maybe that format's coming back. You know what? That was the thing, too. Invincible was a week-to-week show. It, it like, couldn't be binged until, like, the end of the season. Yeah, and, and while you may be tempted to say, but that's under Amazon, isn't it? It's like, no, it's under Robert Kirkman and the creative team developing that show. <laughs> He's hands off with Amazon Studios. <laughs> That's the thing. I like. I like had that moment of pause where I'm like, "Oh, wait a second. We're sitting on Jeff Bezos, but also he's like, dance puppets, dance." He's like, "Yeah, advertise my show, Invincible, while you think you're mocking me." <laughs> I mean, that's the thing. It's like you know, it's like the Middle Ages. Like everybody who did anything had to live under some sort of feudal lord, and Jeff Bezos yeah. just happens to be the person that controls all of Amazon. So yeah, I'm I'm just waiting for our like big like interplanetary hero to like roll onto the planet and <laughs> defeat Jeff Bezos on our behalf. 
Yeah, either that or we just have to pick our side in, like, the Sengoku era, like, Disney versus Amazon wars. Jeff Bezos sends his, like, best Amazon samurais, and they've got, like, cardboard armor with, like, that obnoxious, like, smirking tick logo. <laughs> I don't know if they can withstand the awesome might of Bushido Goofy. I don't know what the fuck is going on. All right. <laughs> Um, next, are you ready for the next rule in epic storytelling? Yes. Okay. Civilizational high stakes, and then in parenthesis, a global threat to humanity, like an alien invasion, hyphen, or a devastating pandemic. I don't know about you, Gus, but I don't want to see the latter in fiction anytime soon. You know, maybe, maybe it's all, maybe it's, we've come full circle, because now I find myself agreeing with Lily Orchard again on another point, which is like, you don't need to make the stakes as high as they could possibly get. You know, plenty yeah. of good stories have like, you know, medium stakes, the small stakes even. Not not too small for me personally, but you know, it, it doesn't always have to be the world's about to end. It could be things are about to get bad in this one village or this one town or for this one person or like again, how tasteless. Uh, he didn't. This is this is the past, right? He didn't know about the. I, I presume so that this is an older one. Yeah. Who knows when this came out? But yeah, to be honest, like, I, I, I can say this without any sense of ambiguity. In Jeff Bezos versus Lily Orchard, I will always go for Lily Orchard because, like, yeah, Lily has some like dumb storytelling opinions, but like. She's ultimately just a relatively harmless YouTuber. Jeff Bezos is a fucking monster who is actively abusing his workers and, like, hurting the planet. Yeah, that's the thing. Like, whatever bad you can say about, um, Lily Orchard, Jeff Bezos has a body count. The worst thing you can say about Lily Orchard is she said this, like, dumb thing or had this stupid opinion on X, Y, and Z or, like, wrote, like, a gross fic ages ago and like i'm sorry i'm not gonna play moral equivalencies between that and letting workers die of fucking heart attacks on the factory floor and not doing shit about it yeah so hot take here and i doubt lily herself would actually agree to this but all of you listening need to know this if you go after lily orchard about like old works or like just bad takes she had that's cancel culture like yeah, the the, <laughs> the concerted effort to drag someone down and to make them like a public laughing stock for something that isn't them anymore. Yeah, yeah, like that is not only pointless but it's vindictive, borderline psychopathic because these people don't deserve that much level of ire when the like real world harm of their actions isn't as notable. Like, start with Bezos and work your way down, is what I'm saying. Yeah, exactly. I think when we did the Lily Orchard rules, it was literally, like, the day they were posted we made that video. So we were hardly muckery. <laughs> we had some muck tipped on us out of a wheelbarrow. <laughs> we had to dig our way out. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Oh, uh, what, one more thing. Um, in regards to... Um, Civilizational like, high stakes. <laughs> in regard to stakes, I wanted to bring up, uh, just because... I got this completely wrong in the original video. Doro Hidoro is not from the 80s. I misspoke. It's actually from the like early 2000s. It's just got an older art style and I got confused because of that. But that show has great personal stakes. All of the characters are basically like out for just themselves, even though they live in a world that like has all of these like overarching crazy systemic problems that are like readily apparent to the viewer. So you can have like a quote unquote epic world, but you don't need to have like it's hard to get characters personally invested in like I personally will stop the world from blowing up by punching the bad. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, exactly. Like I, no one can hold the world together on their own unless unless you, you know, want to go that far with the wish fulfillment. Yeah, I mean, I'll use the same refrain we used in the Lily Orchard one. Just pick your stakes and make us care. Yep, yep. That's all it is. That's a good way of saying it. Couldn't have said it better myself because I didn't. Hey, Gus. Yeah? So, a guy walks into a butcher's shop and he says, Hey, what? I bet you ten bucks you couldn't reach the meat on the top shelf. And the guy goes, Nah, the stakes are too high. <laughs> dude! Wow, dude! Whoa! <laughs> Oh my god! 
Ladies and you gentlemen. You can take that one home with you, friendos. Boys, girls, <laughs> non-binary folks of all definitions. I, I like... Bow in reverence of that 10,000-year-old joke. If you've made it this far into the video, leave a comment that says the stakes are too high. Yeah, it's spelt S-T-E-A-K-S. And everyone who hasn't finished the video will be going down there and be like, Oh, these fucking idiots can't even spell stakes. <laughs> but we'll know, and you're beautiful for doing it. Yeah. We'll know you're the real G's. Yeah, you're the All real right. ones. Next on Jeff's list of ingredients for epic storytelling is humor. <sighs> Let me tell you, at like, we, um, like, as, as writers of a comedy show, the onus is on us to, like, consume a lot of comedy as well, and, like, you know, like, observe it critically. And let me tell you, not all attempts at humor are created equal. Not by a fucking long shot. Yeah, not only that, but like people people didn't watch Game of Thrones for for being a barrel of laughs, did they? Yeah, and I don't get me wrong, you can always have like little jokes in things, but like if you try to force it, you're going to get something that's a tonal mess. I think there's a balance because with Marvel, I'd say it gets too quippy and to the point that, like, the comedy undermines a lot of the stories. Yeah. Again, I'm going to bring up Castlevania because I love the writing in that show. There is, like, just the right amount of, like, quipping and profanity. It all feels very much in character and certain characters will speak certain ways. It doesn't need to be in every story. Yeah, I mean, if Elon Musk going on SNL taught us anything is that maybe we shouldn't follow the advice of very wealthy people on uh, what makes good comedy. Exactly. Well, I mean, all he said was humor. <laughs> like We can get, there's, uh, there's nothing we can we get can Jeff get Bezos him. dressed as Luigi to go... No, he's, he's uh, Waluigi to go with uh, Elon's Wario. That's right. Oh, man. I don't know why. I just have the sense that Jeff Bezos would be taller than Elon, and I'm not going to look it up because... Jeff Bezos, everybody cheating but me. (laughs) And I get back in the fulfillment center. Take this piss... This is attack. It's just like throwing piss bottles at you. Yeah, literally. That that's oh. something that Waluigi probably did in one of the games, honestly. Waluigi drinks them, but also uses them as weapons. He's a bit Je- of a freak like that. Jeff Waluigi Bezos. This next one is fascinating. Yeah. Just the word betrayal. I'm just hearing Spoonie <laughs> yelling betrayal at that fucking games con with like Angry Joe looking super uncomfortable next to him. God, this is like this is such a video game thing. Think of how many times, like, the person helping you turns on you, or, like, you betray somebody, or, like, like, this feels really gamery. This whole, this whole list reads like that one joke in, uh, OKKO, when, uh, like, Shannon and some of the other robots make, like, an algorithmically generated movie. Yeah. That's like, ah, we have all of the best scenes from other movies in this because it was generated by algorithm. And the people in the crowd are just going crazy. And shit like that is Jeff Bezos' dream. Just get robots to pump it out. Yeah, that's the thing. Everybody who's like a writer out there, remember, people like Jeff Bezos, if they could replace you, they would. Our work is necessary, it's important, and our imaginations are irreplaceable. Don't let these motherfuckers in their ivory towers pretend that it's any different. They know the score, yeah. and that's why they're afraid of us, but also that's why they hire us. Yeah, Je- uh, Jeff Bezos does not care if you live or die. And that's something that you'll be wise to remember if you want to, you know, not be taken advantage of in life. Yeah, exactly. Speaking of fucking robots, you're not going to believe this. Fucking robots. The next thing... How'd you know about my whole Thursday? Yeah. Roborotica. <laughs> the next thing on his ingredients of epic storytelling. This genuinely feels like parody. Positive emotions. We, we're just like... Wait. We, we've just fallen wait. to the building blocks, right? Wait. Positive emotions. And then in parenthesis, love, joy, hope. Well, you gotta remind himself what those are. Yeah, he's got to list those, because if you work for Amazon, you've forgotten what those are. And he's positive emotions? Things I can no longer feel. Love, joy, 
excitement. Things that our products get, give people at the expense of you ever filling it again. See, I don't know about love and joy, but I think his employees feel plenty of excrement. Yeah, they feel it in the adult diapers they have to wear because of the nightmarish hours and the fucking, like, house arrest style fucking ankle tags they have to wear. This is (laughs) also just like, no, a story's got to be all negative emotions. It's just got to be all pain. It's got to be all suffering. Incidentally, the one after that is negative emotions. (laughs) Then in parenthesis, loss. Sorrow. <laughs> this dude is not even trying anymore. This is get this man out of here. Get this man. He does not know what he's talking about. No, this is peak. Like you know, these people are just like smiling and nodding, <laughs> writing it down. I think oh, okay. Once Jeff leaves, we can go back to writing again. Uh, I know. I know what you're thinking. We're, we've not. We've not included as much substance on positive and negative emotions. But like, what the fuck is there to say? It- Okay, the one thing I can say on this is, like, maybe positive and neg- negative emotions aren't two distinct groups. Maybe emotions are more complicated than that. Maybe we need all of our emotions to relate to the world. Even that, if he's if he's listing positive and negative emotions, just, like, it helps if your characters feel things during the course of the movie, or book, or game, or show, or... <laughs> Leave right into the fucking writers, Jeff. Like, you don't know what you're fucking talking about. If you're out here saying, oh, make sure the story has feelings. No shit. If things happen, it should hopefully produce feelings in the things it's happening to and the people doing it. What the fuck is next? Like, humans? Words? Nouns? Like, what are we this getting is next? The... So we're on the last ingredient to epic storytelling, and it feels just ominous in its placement as the, the most, last one. The most epic one. It's just the word. It's just the word violence. <laughs> He's right. He's right. Especially like, especially like class war, revolutions. Oh, <laughs> violence. It's it's the most epic thing you could possibly do. Show Jeff Bezos yeah. how epic your violence d- in Minecraft. I mean Roblox. I mean fuck. Yeah. <laughs> God damn it. Oh, like gee. the thing is, I cannot imagine anyone watching this unless you've not seen any of our other, any of our other videos. I can't imagine you've learned much about writing. But the point of that is the fact that like these are the fuckers green lighting projects. And they're this clueless. Okay, so just for shits and giggles, I'm going to try and put all this together and make a story on the fly. You want to give them to me? All right, so do you want me to read each one? All right, yeah, 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 let's make one up. Let's do a bit of an iceberg. All right, right. right, so a heroic protagonist who experiences growth and change, a compelling antagonist, wish fulfillment, e.g. the protagonist has hidden abilities such as superpowers or magic, Moral choices, diverse world building, different geographic locations, urgency to watch next episode, cliffhangers, civilizational high stakes, a global threat to humanity like an alien invasion or a devastating pandemic, humor, betrayal, positive emotions, love, joy, hope, negative emotions, loss, sorrow, and violence. Okay, so, uh, this is about a, this is about a white male hero who called Jeff <laughs> called Jeff <laughs> he named Jeff he named Jeff <laughs> he has the ability to uh turn other human beings into weapons just permanently they don't turn back <laughs> he, he, so he he does that and there's a alien invasion and it's happening all over every other continent he's the only hero he sometimes feels good about it sometimes feels bad about it And he has to make a lot of moral choices at the airport when he's flying to all these different places. (laughs) Like, you know, does he bring all the guns in his bag or does he not? And every episode is half of him uh, being in the airport and hijacking planes to go to (laughs) other to go to other locations to fight aliens that are all compelling and different in different parts of the world, killing the aliens and then rinse and repeat. Uh, and, like, every single time, uh, every single episode ends with, like, airport security, like, about to get him. So, that, that is, that is, um, that is my story of, uh, Jeff Airlines. That's, that's the name of the story. 
he's flying planes, fighting UFOs, fighting aliens. What more do you want? I don't know. I mean, it, it was pretty good, but I don't think we could call it epic. I mean, I didn't laugh once, and where's the betrayal? I'm sorry, Gus. You're not getting greenlit on this one. Okay, okay. He betrays himself, and that's funny. <laughs> He betray yeah, he betrays his own principles and it's fucking hilarious. He betrays the planet Earth, teams up with the aliens, because it the aliens make him laugh. And he and they make him feel positive emotions. So, well, this Jeff Airlines guy sounds like a real prick. Yeah, well he doesn't really care about people. He just he decides I'm gonna use all these people as a like resource. So that I can continue to make these things that let me do the things I want to do. And uh, essentially, I'm going to, you know, sell off the entire human race as a product to something that is completely inhuman and will eventually collapse and really has no business being a part of uh, human's life. But in the end, it, it doesn't matter because he's just maximizing the amount of fun he can have regardless of all the betrayal and that's the theme it's you can betray as many people as you like as long as it's fun for you a beautiful story that we can all relate to it's so epic so tell us down in the comments what was your favorite jeff bezos rating tip and remember eat the rich <laughs> yeah <laughs> and they taste like shit <laughs>